I'm Rachel and I'm here to do my favorite writer's tag. Uh, my favorite writer's tag was started by Steve Donahue. I think he got the inspiration from another video. He wanted us to go through some of our favorite authors, our not quite favorite authors, and our maybe favorite authors. <laughs> and I figured this might be a good time to do the tag because I'm too invested in NaNoWriMo right now to be too concerned about judgment over these choices. <laughs> So here I go. I'll start with three of my maybe authors. And the first one I could think of is Amos Oz. Uh, Amos Oz was an Israeli uh, writer who recently died. Uh, and I'm putting him in the maybe category because I'm far from having read his entire uh, collection of works in fiction and nonfiction. But certainly from what I have read, uh, I identify a lot with his politics, his empathy, his way of thinking. I may actually think that his nonfiction is stronger than his fiction. <laughs> the second person I decided to put in this category is Anne Frank. <laughs> and I don't know, all of my reasoning seems kind of weird. But for this one, I guess I was thinking, you know, I've read her diary, of course, and uh, I really loved it. And one of the things that really makes me think of is uh, how astute she was for her, own, for her age, uh, how much of a good writer she was, you know, for being such a young girl and a teenager and how much I think she really would have matured into a renowned woman of letters or someone who should have been renowned based on her talent and I don't know maybe in the 50s as a woman she wouldn't have been but uh, <laughs> I just uh, come back to thinking that you know we have what's basically her juvenilia and because she died in the Holocaust, uh, we never would get a chance to know what type of writer she could have matured into. And it's really such a shame. I mean, of course, no deaths by persecution are a good thing, but uh, I'm just thinking in her specific case, I know that uh, she gets a lot more attention than, than most victims of the Holocaust, but I do think there is truth to the matter that she was... Uh, particularly skilled. She was an artist. She really had gifts to give to the world, and she was able to give a few in that attic, and I think, uh, I think she could have given so much more. My third and final maybe is Joan Legant, uh, as different from the other two as they are from each other. Uh, she is a minor writer. She's written a collection of short stories and a novel that I really liked, all on Jewish themes. And, uh, you know, she isn't all that well-known, she isn't all that popular, and isn't, uh, doesn't have a huge backlist behind her, but uh, I feel like I should uh, keep her in the back of my mind for if uh, she publishes anything else, because uh, I really have liked her stuff so far. Uh, for my not-quite authors, I have six people, and I'll start with Suzanne Collins. I just wrote a long nano blogmo piece on her, particularly on The Hunger Games and uh, its upcoming prequel. And I've read, I think, almost uh, everything that uh, Collins has written. I haven't read her picture book for, for young children. Uh, I'm mostly familiar with The Hunger Games, and I have read once uh, through her uh, middle grade uh, series. Uh, I think Collins is often dismissed, as uh, many YA authors are, but uh, to me, I think it's uh, quite patently obvious that uh, she is writing about war for children and for young adults, and has much deeper messages that she's talking about than it seems apparent on the surface. It's also true that The Hunger Games is uh, one of my favorite series of all time, and yes, I read them as adult, an adult, and I'm definitely uh, incredibly invested in her new book. Next I'll go for uh, J.K. Rowling, probably not as denigrated as far as uh, YA and middle grade authors go, just because of how huge her impact has been with the Harry Potter series. I love the Harry Potter series, uh, and it's been one of uh, the most integral parts of uh, my life, really. I mean, not even so much because of the books, but because it's uh, formed uh, friendships for me. I, it's uh, some of my closest friendships and uh, most important experiences as a person have come from my affiliation and reading of the Harry Potter books. To a certain extent, I do think it's a generational thing, because I was a, a child and a teenager when uh, the books started coming out. But I do think uh, Harry Potter has the potential to become classic books for uh, 
you know, for future generations. I'm certainly looking forward very much to introducing them to my niece and nephew. Beyond the Harry Potter series, I believe, uh, maybe even more for me personally, I really loved The Casual Vacancy, and uh, I read it a few years after, uh, well, grad school, I believe, and uh, <laughs> grad school was something that sort of uh, beat the love of reading out of me for a while, I have to admit, and uh, I was very slow on my feet for, for a little bit, but uh, in reading The Casual Vacancy, I think I, I fell back in love with literary fiction, and I think... Uh, J.K. Rowling was an integral part of that as well. Admittedly, I haven't read her uh, mystery novels, that's not my genre, but uh, I kind of hope she returns to uh, more literary fiction in the vein of The Casual Vacancy. Next, I'm going with Tamara Pierce. She is a Y author from my own YA days. Uh, and I, she's on this list particularly because I really have only read um, a couple of her series, and I'm not sure I'm incredibly invested in reading some of the other stuff that uh, she wrote when I was an adult. But uh, in terms of forming me as a preteen and teen reader, uh, the Immortalist series uh, was the big one for me. Uh, I really loved that fantasy series. I even incorporated it into a short story. Uh, just name dropping, as you do. And uh, I also read her Song of the Lioness series, uh, her first two uh, series uh, set in a fantasy, uh, epic fantasy world, and then uh, some of her Circle of Magic uh, books as well that came out uh, basically in the 90s when uh, I was a teen. and. Uh, yeah, I just, I really loved it, and I'm so excited because uh, she's currently in the middle of writing a prequel uh, series to the one of the characters from The Immortalists, and uh, it's like going back in time, kind of, and fleshing out that world that uh, was one of the uh, preliminary uh, fantasy worlds that got me into the genre. So uh, I'm hoping uh, she's continuing on, and we'll get book two of the prequel soon. <laughs> Next, I'm going with Tova Mervis. She's another adult uh, novelist and memoirist who deals with uh, Jewish themes. And it almost feels weird not to have her on my favorites list because I actually made a video, one of my first booktube videos about her as uh, a favorite Jewish novelist. Uh, Mervis uh, grew up and lived for a while as modern Orthodox and she ultimately left that fold and has become more secular. She's gotten a lot of uh, pushback from her community about that, but uh, I think uh, she wrote a couple of novels, particularly her first two, which are about uh, the modern Orthodox community, and I think that she treated uh, those characters with a lot of love and respect without uh, whitewashing any of uh, the issues that might come up in uh, such a cloistered society. I like her third book as well, Visible City, which is kind of an ode to living in New York City that she wrote after she left. And then she uh, wrote her memoir as well about her own uh, separation, because she called it the Book of Separation, uh, from uh, Orthodoxy. And uh, it was just very uh, vivid and raw, and it also, just as a fan of her novels, uh, gave me some insight into where she was when she was writing. So that was uh, intriguing, and I hope she'll be back with something new soon. Next on the list is Becky Chambers. I just recently read her novella, so I think I've read all of her major uh, works. I'm not sure if she's written any short stories, and of course in science fiction and fantasy the short stories uh, have a life of their own. I guess that's also true in literary fiction, that, uh, but I think it's kind of more okay to in uh, literary fiction circles to ignore people's short works, whereas... Uh, Science fiction and fantasy might be uh, more gung-ho about them. But anywho, I've read Chambers' Wayfarer series and now her novella, and there's just something so homey about her. It kind of goes back to some of the stuff that I guess first got me into the genre, particularly this time in television, uh, because some of her favorite shows that uh, influenced uh, the Wayfarer series are like mine. I mean, people think of Firefly, which I liked, but uh, she also gave a big interview about how uh, she was influenced by Farscape, which was, is my favorite series on, uh, from still. <laughs> <You know? laughs> They're about aliens and adventure and future tech, perhaps a little uh, light on the hard science, but giving some nods to it. But I really think uh, they're very much about what it is to, to be human, even with aliens who might not seem human, they are pretty much human. 
just on a, a broader, more uh, diverse and quirky canvas. And that's how I feel about the Wayfarer series. Uh, the novella, To Be Taught If Fortunate, does go a little deeper into hard science and questions about uh, what it takes uh, for humans to survive uh, for long periods in space, and questions just about uh, the meaning of the scientific community and what it means to explore, and particularly uh, through the context of where we are on Earth now with uh, climate change issues and also just our general ongoing issues of uh, political and social ups and downs. The weird juxtaposition of uh, that uh, specific uh, history uh, versus uh, the history of science and light years and if you travel across that how small and insignificant uh, the minutia of a human life can seem like. I don't know, there's still something so loving and earnest about what she writes and uh, I think a lot of sci-fi fans uh, I think don't like uh, that she is what they call conflict diverse uh, but uh, I generally seem to like it. I feel like she's found a really intriguing balance of a slice of life within this macro world and uh, she has that sense of wonder that uh, I think draws me in and reminds me of Farscape and of the things that drew me into science fiction. And so uh, I hope she might return to the Wayfarer series or I'll be really curious to see what she does next. And my final uh, not quite is Elena Ferrante. I've read all of her books. I'm not sure if I'd love, love all of them, but uh, I think the Neapolitan series is uh, at the top and I appreciate what she's doing with all of her books. She captures what it means uh, to be indignant and angry as a woman in societal constructs that want to erase you. Leela from the Neapolitan series is certainly uh, the best example of that, or at least the most relatable to people, uh, in terms of uh, how she's a prodigy and she has all of these strong opinions that I think transcend a lot of the politics and interpersonal relationships that uh, people in her town are trying to force her into. She also has a new novel coming out next year, so I'm intrigued to see where she will go next. And finally, I have my top five favorite authors. I'll start with my uh, YA author who made this cut, uh, Mary Downing Hahn, just because uh, she influenced my reading the most. I think she was my first favorite author and I just can't seem to quit her. <laughs> Even though I haven't read a lot of her more recent work, she's been writing now for, you know, 30, over 30 years. Uh, she used to stay more in the uh, realist genres now. It seems like she's predominantly writing ghost stories. She wrote a few that I've read when I was, you know, in my... Uh, tweens and teens, but uh, she's writing more of them now, and um, all of my favorites, uh, including what I still call my favorite novel, Daphne's book, they're all uh, realist fiction about young girls uh, growing up. She's also a local to me author, and uh, a lot of her stories are, uh, take place in Maryland, where I live. She's also a children's librarian, and later in my life I went to library uh, school, although uh, I don't think I uh, necessarily followed in her footsteps on purpose, but I still love the connection. And I think her books would still be relatively uh, approachable for, for young girls today. I'll have to keep that in mind uh, for, you know, for my niece. She doesn't talk down to kids, she doesn't ignore their feelings or any... Uh, problems that might exist in their external lives. You know, there's a lot of broken families in her uh, in her books without going too much into melodrama. I don't know if she's really known beyond a regional level because, you know, she's a Maryland author, but uh, she should be. Next, I think I'm going for a cheat because I decided to put in for number two, the Bronte sisters. <laughs> I just wrote a long, rambling adoration comment on one of uh, Britta Bowler's uh, videos on the Brontes. Uh, to summarize, uh, I first uh, fell for Jane Eyre by, by Charlotte. Uh, I read it in eighth grade as part of my uh, required reading for school. Uh, what struck me then as a teenager is uh, how 
patently unfair Jane's life was, and, you know, Charlotte was making no bones about it, but also how Jane was uh, refusing to accept things on their surface, even as she was being abused for her uh, obstinance in that way. I admit I'm falling a bit out of love with Rochester myself, although I don't think he was ever the most important part of it for me. He was kind of a battery. He was mostly interesting because he'd listen to Jane. <laughs> she was much more fascinating to me and continues to be so, uh, but I would have chosen another guy, Jane. <laughs> although as a person I feel like I identify the most with Charlotte and uh, these unsuitable, unrequited love uh, obsessions. <laughs> So from there, I read Wuthering Heights on my own, often secretly in Spanish class. <laughs> so, and uh, Wuthering Heights, Emily Bronte, that one's my favorite. Uh, there's just uh, so much to love about it, so much passion. Uh, things that leap off the page about uh, Bronte's characters and what she's exploring about uh, the price of revenge. I think... Uh, one thing Emily has that perhaps neither of her sisters have so much is that she is not uh, sentimental with her characters. I mean, Rochester is a fair bit like Heathcliff, maybe not quite as bad, but certainly in that vein. But uh, Emily does not treat Heathcliff as the romantic hero, despite what some people believe. <laughs> I also have a real soft spot for Nellie Dean, although uh, so many people dismiss her as unimportant in that whole, you know, Victorian uh, necessity of uh, having to witness the story through these uh, unimportant narrators on the side. <laughs> but, uh, I feel like Nellie Dean was uh, our conduit. She was the one who was, you know, the human being who wasn't crazy. <laughs> You know, she was our safe space to watch this drama through, and uh, I spent a lot of the novel wanting to save Nellie Dean. <laughs> Somehow I didn't make it to Anne's works until I was an adult, uh, or I think I might have tried The Tenant of Wildfell Hall uh, when I was a teenager, and maybe, maybe I was exhausted by Wuthering Heights by that point, uh, and I put it down, and I finally got back to it as an adult. Uh, I've read all of uh, the Bronte works. Uh, I mean, they're novels. Uh, but anyway, when it comes to Anne, um, I mean, The Tenant of Wildfell Hall is uh, leagues better than <laughs> Agnes Grey. And uh, surely it's also uh, fascinating from Charlotte Bronte because of uh, what it says about Emily. And it's such an interesting eulogy to her sister and maybe a character study like nothing we'd ever see before. And also I need to read Villette again, but away from Charlotte. And also the professor sucked. Anyway, away from Charlotte. <laughs> I think uh, The Tenet of Wildfell Hall is, is fascinating, and there's some things about it that are the same and different to her sisters. I feel like there's this passion uh, in Helen that's, that's kind of similar to Jane, in that she was dealt a raw hand with this abusive, alcoholic husband, and she was sick to death of it. I mean, there's something much more realist about uh, Anne, Anne's work, you know, it's not this gothic, over-the-top, windswept Moors stuff as much. Uh, in fact, I feel certain that I, I heard a booktuber say that she liked Anne better because of that more realist uh, focus, although now I can't seem to find that video. <laughs> I get that nowadays it's not so shocking to say that, hey, living with an abusive alcoholic husband really sucks, but uh, I still feel like uh, Anne dug into those emotions and I really appreciated it. Although Gilbert, like so many other guys, he sucks. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, the Brontes. Now I'm starting to ramble. Rambling enough that my uh, battery has gone down considerably. So anyway, my next uh, one that I want to mention on my favorites list is Allegra Goodman. I also made a video uh, for her about her being one of my favorite Jewish novelists. Uh, although I think my favorite of her novels that I've re read is uh, Intuition, which uh, has some nominally Jewish characters, but uh, is predominantly about a sm uh, small uh, research uh, lab of oncologists. And I feel like uh, my favorite of her novels uh, is about small insular communities, also Catterskill Falls, which is about an orthodox enclave. Uh, what I think she excels at the most is getting these intricate details about what people feel or believe. Uh, just, you know, this type of stuff that I don't think comes naturally to all writers, but comes naturally to her. Her most recent book was a bit of a dud and a bit of a disappointment for me and quite uh, 
moralizing really uh, but um, I'm always going to stick with her I'm curious to see where she goes next number four on the list is Jhumpa Lahiri I think she might be the uh, most successful writer in terms of the lyricism of her prose she is such a beautiful stylist both in her uh, long form and her short form in literary fiction uh, and I feel like it's such a shame that she's not writing so much of her own stuff anymore though uh, it's fascinating to see her fall in love with Italian culture and start to translate. Uh, I still need to read her memoir on the subject. Uh, and I feel so personally biased about so much about Lahiri because uh, the way she wrote about her Bengali culture reminded me so much about my Jewish culture. And now she's going into Italian culture and I happen to be Italian-American and so I'm like, ah. and, and And on an even sillier level for me, uh, one of my friends who is Bengali, uh, her parents and uh, Lahiri's parents ran in the same circles. So <laughs> I'm cool by association of association. <laughs> and finally, number five on my favorite authors list is Meg Wallitzer. I recently did a whole uh, years long uh, project of uh, reading all of her backlist. I read three books a year and made booktube videos about them. Uh, her first couple of books were kind of dead, so, uh, but uh, since then she has flourished. Uh, she particularly got famous for The Interestings, which I think was phenomenal uh, in terms of uh, studying a, a group of friends and how they uh, matured and progressed uh, throughout their lives. Uh, and I also think uh, The Female Persuasion was also really good in um, studying feminism and how it manifests within uh, society and feminist cultures and uh, the broader culture uh, generationally too. Uh, and The Wife was made into a movie and uh, I feel like uh, the movie reminded me how powerful the, the novel really is and particularly the main character and uh, position she finds herself in is uh, being the underappreciated support staff, but uh, with a rather secret role in her uh, blowhard husband's life. I love Surrender Dorothy, which is about uh, a woman who dies in a, in a fatal, just fatal car crash, a very sudden, and it's about uh, her friends and her mother getting together to mourn her, and you see how differently she uh, was perceived in all of their lives. I just uh, feel like Wallitzer is kind of down to earth in some ways, like maybe less hoity toity in literary than Lahiri or Goodman, but she still has the same kind of grasp on characters and on sexuality too, on female sexuality. I think she's great. And I'm so glad it seems to be her star is rising. So that about covers it for me now. I guess I'll leave links to uh, the author Goodreads pages down below, or maybe uh, something better if the Goodreads pages aren't that great. Uh, and in my last uh, tag video, I uh, tagged uh, everyone in my NaNoWriMo Voxer group. Uh, but in that uh, tag, I talked a lot about that Voxer group and also about the BookTube prize. So in this video, I will tag anyone who is associated with the BookTube prize. I will be back tomorrow to post my week two vlog of NaNoWriMo. I'm a little late getting this video up because I was away for the weekend with my family. And then next week, hopefully around the weekendish time, I will be back with an author tube video because I do one of those every month, even when I'm already uh, inundating you with a bunch of NaNoWriMo stuff. So stay tuned. Thank you so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.